All right. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining me today. I hope everyone's having a good day so far. My name's Rob Moore. I'm the Chief Technology Officer of MakerX, which is a relatively new company formed uh, just over a year ago, co-founded by myself and Matt Davies. And we build end-to-end -end digital products to help startups, uh, venture builders, and corporates. So over the last 12 months, I've been working on a journey of discovery in the Web3 space, uh, which is one of many technology areas that we're exploring. Now, I'm not a Web3 maxi, and I'm not a Web3 hater as well. I'm kind of holding a pragmatic middle ground, and I see the potential aspects of this technology when applied in the right way, but I'm under no illusion about some of the awful things that are happening in this space. So I guess in the lead up to giving this talk, I've performed months of extensive research into the space. I've published about 45 minutes worth of reading material. I have a QR code at the end if you want to have some light bedtime reading. Um, I've talked to numerous people, including skeptics, um, believers, builders, people thinking about building um, businesses in this space. And my team and myself have built and designed Web3 software for ourselves and also for some of our clients. Now, as fair warning, uh, this is a pretty meaty talk. There is a lot of content to get through. I've, I've just um, hid 10 slides because there's too much content. Um, and, um, but look, I'm going to try to keep it interesting and, and you know, I've mixed in a few real world examples and anecdotes and case studies um, wherever I can. So hopefully you can bear with me for the next hour or so as we get through this into the lunch break. So why am I giving this talk? What's the goal here? Well, um, out of curiosity for the people in the room, put your hand up if you've um, been asked by someone or had a conversation with someone about some sort of Web3 or crypto or blockchain topic. So maybe, I don't know, 50%. Um, the thing is, this stuff's becoming more mainstream, regardless of your views on the particular subject. You will or are getting asked by your customers, your family, your colleagues, your friends, managers, maybe the board of your company about this. And personally, I believe it's important to be able to respond in an informed manner. And I think that's actually really hard to do since this space is A, so complex, B, so mired in controversy and, and also a lot of emotion. So my goal here is to take you through a very comprehensive, as you'll see, factual exploration of Web3, the good, the bad and the ugly so that you have the grounding to be able to A, have mature conversations about this stuff and B, form your own opinion and judgment about what you are and aren't comfortable participating with in this space, if at all. So what are we going to talk through? We're going to very briefly talk about what Web3 actually is, because um, that may not even be clear, as we'll see. Uh, we're going to talk about the cultural war surrounding Web3 and why that makes it so hard to engage in this space. And then the vast majority of the discussion is going to be on the ethical, pragmatic Web3 decision framework that, um, that I've created. And there's a whole heap of, I think it's 11 maybe, topics that we're going to kind of go through. And there's some pretty, as I said, some pretty meaty con content in there. So let's start with what is Web3. First and foremost, it is a buzzword. And like all good tech industry buzzword it is, it is ill-defined and it's surrounded by hype and disclarity. It also means different things to different people. If you go and talk to three different people, um, regardless of whether or not they're actually in the web industry or not, I bet you they'll give you three different definitions of what this stuff actually is. Uh, and the hard part maybe is also that Web3 isn't a single thing. It's actually a collection of not only technologies, but also approaches. And so that also makes it a little bit hard to define. So let's start with my definition of Web3. Um, the way I see it, there's three key pillars. The first is public blockchain. So we've got a publicly visible, tamper-proof, append-only ledger of information and data. And there isn't just one blockchain, there's hundreds of them. The next is a concept called tokenization. This is the creation of digital objects that represent verifiable and ownable digital items. These objects can be purely digital. For example, I'm sure many of you would have heard of cryptocurrencies and NFTs. But they absolutely can also be real world assets, um, which I think is where some of the most interesting applications of this technology come to life. And then the third concept is decentralization. 
So we're moving some or all of a given process from being an interaction with someone to a centralised party with a you know, private database or ecosystem, world garden, whatever you want to call it, um, to being instead more user to user. Now there's a number of things that you'll hear about related to Web3. Some of them are listed there. The blockchain, obviously, uh, tokens, smart contracts, wallets, decentralised applications or dApps. The way I see it, these things are the building blocks. They're the technology. They're not the point. Now, um, I said different people have different definitions of what, what Web3 is. So here's another viewpoint. This is what McKinsey, um, how they describe it. And there's a QR code there if you want to read their article. It's pretty good. Um, theirs is a similar definition. They've got the blockchain bit and they've got the, they say digital assets and tokens, which is probably more focusing on the tech side of what I call tokenization. They've added smart contracts, which I just said was a building block and instead I had decentralization. So you kind of see how there's some differences in the way people describe this stuff and what is and isn't part of it. But that's okay, that's just something to keep in mind. The most important thing, of course, though, is what does it facilitate? Why would you use it? When would you use it? I think there's three key pillars to this. Trust, security, and tradability. So for trust, if you're operating in an industry where it might benefit your users to have direct, deep, transparent insight into every operation that can occur with a minimum of additional work involved to provide that, maybe it's relevant. And there's a number of architectural properties that public blockchains give you, like immutability, public inspectability, and transparency that help facilitate this. From a security perspective, if your users can benefit from securely making an exchange only once um, both or multiple parties fulfill their end of a given deal, um, or maybe um, you can benefit from knowing that the data you need to run your business has not been tampered with, as an example, then this can be relevant. And again, there's a number of architectural properties like multi-party transaction atomicity, crypto, uh, cryptographic verifiability, that's really hard to say, privacy um, and uh, enforced auditable history are examples there. And then the last one's tradability. There's some sort of use case where you want users to be able to directly trade goods, services, assets, or currency, um, particularly in a situation where maybe some of that stuff's been locked up or it's only tradable in narrow circumstances um, that you want to you know, increase or there's sort of limited platforms or geographies that you've been able to, to trade in, then maybe this is relevant. And again, there's a number of architectural properties, global tradability, ownership, automation, process efficiency that come into play here. So this is the super high level, like theoretical kind of like why would you use it? But we'll go into some more examples as we go through the talk. So let's move on to the culture war. The reason why I want to talk about this is because I think this is the thing that makes Web3 really hard to, to talk about or sometimes even admit that you're like exploring it to see what the fuss is about. And there's a number of reasons for this. Um, again, it covers so many different possible things. And some of those things, you know, maybe aren't even relevant to you and you don't care about them. Like, let's say, cryptocurrency trading and speculation. You might be like, this is my personal opinion. You know, that stuff just is weird and, and it, it can go over there and I don't care about that. But because that's kind of, you know, brought into the whole spectrum and ecosystem of Web3, that comes into the conversation and it mires things. Another one is that there's so much complexity and obscured language. Once you start diving into this space, there's all these wild terms and acronyms and things that just like are completely foreign and the people in this space are using it all the time. It's the, the lingo that, that, that's being used and that creates this barrier, right, to understanding it and to participating in it. And there's also a lot of emotion out there on both sides of the spectrum, there are people on one side that say that Web3 is evil and anyone participating in anything to do with Web3 is evil. And on the other side, there's people saying, you know, fuck the government, um, fuck corporations, let's decentralise everything. Now, quite clearly, those two are very big extremes. And um, I think I've made it clear, I sit somewhere in the middle, pragmatically looking at these things and going, well, you wouldn't use it for everything, but there are some things that you can use it for where it actually helps, makes things better. So that's, that's the, the hard part, I guess, of engaging in this space is our social media feeds for the last six to 12 months are filled with this. And, and um, then the other thing, of course, being that, you know, profile picture NFTs have taken over the conversation and you've got situations like this 
frankly silly pixel drawing someone paid $23 million for. Now quite clearly, I think we can all agree that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. There isn't actually $23 million of value in a pixel drawing. That's silly. Um, so um, there's a really good article that I encourage people to read um, that was written, I think it was like six months ago, no, December, eight months ago, by Carly Robertson. Um, they kind of talked and, and explored this culture war. There's a really nice quote here. Um, the harder it is to have an honest dialogue in the industry about the promise of the technology and to reckon with the harms of the rising tide of crypto scams and other bad behaviour. Um, then, you know, we, we need to be able to move past these polarising discussions and have frank conversations and explore the good, bad and the ugly. And so hopefully that's what this talk today can do with you. So we're going to dive now into the ethical, pragmatic Web3 decision framework. That's quite a mouthful. Um, this is something that I built, um, uh, you know, with my colleagues in MakerX early on um, when we were finding that, um, especially, frankly, in the space that we operate in, like startups and ventures, a lot of people exploring Web3. So we've got clients coming to us asking us about this. We had an idea of a venture we wanted to build that isn't possible without public blockchain. And if we have time, I'll talk a little bit about that later. And we care about the environment and, you know, underprivileged people and all the other, you know, things that are on our social media feeds saying that Web3 is, you know, really bad. And so we wanted to be able to, um, you know, make an informed, fact-based, non-emotional decision about what we were and weren't comfortable participating in. And we created this decision framework to help us do that. And we hope that it helps others do the same thing. So what we've done is we've broken it into three different kind of um, categories of consideration, let's call it. So we've got practicality at the top, which is just like, if you're going to build something that's valuable, what are the practical considerations to be able to build that thing? The second one is users. How does this thing interact with the users that you're going to engage as part of building whatever it is you're building? And the third is the more global consideration of environmental, social and governments or ESG. Within each of these, there's a series of considerations that you sh can slash should look at. Um, and for each one, we recommend looking at it from both a, a global perspective, what's happening in the broader industry, a project perspective, what can you do if you're building a project, and a user perspective, how does it impact the users of your project. So we're going to go through um, each of these. I've grouped a bunch of them up into like logical groups. Um, so we've got, as I said, about 11 of these we're going to go through. So let's dive in. Environment and energy, uh, I, personally, I think is probably the most important because like, you know, we're, we're steadily um, heading towards destroying our planet. I have young kids and I worry about our future. And certainly in this space, there are a, a lot of, cons um, um, what's the right word? Um, criticisms, thank you, uh, of, um, of, of you know, Web3, right? Uh, and in particular, proof of work um, blockchains, of which there are a few. Bitcoin uh, is probably the most recognizable, and until recently, Ethereum. Uh, they use a lot of energy, um, and they need a lot of computing power. So people set up GPU farms, they burn them out, and they discard them. So it generates a lot of e-waste, um, and has contributed towards a global chip shortage. There's also an interesting consideration of the fact that there is actually a global energy shortage. Um, so if you're using energy on things that, especially if you don't think there's much value in it, um, that's an opportunity cost. Now, it's a bit more nuanced than that, of course, because when you generate energy, typically you have to use it in that locality, and maybe there isn't always energy being generated at the places where there is a shortage, but you know, it's still a thing. Now, from an industry perspective, um, some proof of stake, that's the other type, main type of blockchain, um, are very, very efficient. They've explicitly been designed to be environmentally friendly and we'll show a couple of examples of that in a second. Some chains are even carbon negative where they offset more carbon than they produce in their already um, efficient chain. And then they go a step further and then represent those offsets as records on their blockchain so that it's verifiable as well. Um, the other one that's kind of an interesting concept that some people that are 
um, fans of Bitcoin talk about is the fact that if you are a miner consuming a lot of power to generate Bitcoin, then you are incentivized to spend money on um, energy innovation and creating um, energy sources that are, um, you know, um, environmentally friendly. Um, so, you know, uh, make of that what you will, but um, it's a it's a thing that it's a you know thing that people talk about. Now, from your perspective, if you're building a project, two key things I think are firstly carefully choose your blockchain, and in a sec we'll see why that's so important, um, and consider maybe offsetting your project. Now. What do we mean when we say like, you know, a lot of energy use versus not? Now I'm gonna point out here, this scale here, that's logarithmic, that's the linear scale. So what we've got here in gray um, for comparison. So that's a single Google search there, thousand joules of energy, uh, visa transaction, a little bit more, burning a gallon of petrol there, okay? Now on the right hand side, you can see the red ones, they're the um, main proof of work blockchains. Look how crazy Bitcoin is. That's 1.2 million visa transactions for one Bitcoin transaction, right? That's why I don't use Bitcoin, I never have and I never will. Um, and Ethereum Classic, before they changed to proof of stake, like similarly is, is you know, a, a fair amount of energy usage. Now, this, I guess the, the, one of the problems is that Bitcoin and Ethereum are the two probably most commonly used blockchains and some people think they're the only ones that exist. But if you look here, the ones in blue, they're the proof of stake ones. Um, We've got some like, say, Algorand and Hedera in particular that are actually specifically designed to be very environmentally friendly and actually take less energy than a Google search for each transaction. And both of those actually offset their emissions so they are actually carbon negative. So that's why blockchain choice is so important. Um, now, it's really complex to try to dig in and understand the amount of carbon use because there are so many factors that affect it. But to help you out a bit, there is actually a crypto carbon footprint list by CryptoWiser um, that you can check out and they keep maintaining this and they basically got the relative ratings of the different blockchains so that you can make more of an informed decision. So criminal activity is another one that commonly comes up in social feeds. And there are a number of things to talk about. Is there's clear examples where market manipulation has happened, including wash trading and pump and dumps. Uh, there's a lot of fraud, including scams, grifting, rug pulls, as they're called. There's tax avoidance, theft, money laundering, ransomware, rogue state funding, and sanction avoidance, which is particularly relevant at the moment, given the Ukraine war with Russia under a lot of sanctions. To offset some of that, um, it's interesting to point out that the regulatory landscape here is rapidly maturing and we'll, we'll cover a bit of detail on that in a bit. Um, there are many examples of people being arrested um, for, for doing dodgy things. So it's not like they can completely escape the law. Another really interesting thing is because in a public blockchain all of the transactions are visible, that means that companies are out there analysing this information and figuring out which transactions are illicit or not and providing that information to law enforcement. Um, and I'll show you this in a sec, but the actual relative proportion of criminal activity is actually falling significantly as more mainstream use of Web3 technologies happens. From a project perspective, there's a bunch of things you can do. Um, you know, you should educate your users about how to avoid being scammed. Um, you, I think, should identify the project owners. There are a bunch of projects out there that have anonymous um, owners. Like, how can you know to trust that project if you don't identify yourselves? Um, if there's any kind of like asset that you're trading or something like that, especially if there's like copyright involved, you can prove your authenticity and show that you have the right to be selling that stuff to add even more weight behind your project. And just because we're doing Web3 things doesn't mean we can throw away or should throw away all of the things that we've built up over years and years and years. Things like know your customer checks. Um, and, you know, look, think about any processes you can put in place to lessen any potential illegal activity on any project that you're building is another consideration. Now, I mentioned that the relative proportion of criminal activity is falling. Um, there's something called the, 20, uh, the crypto crime report by a company called Chainalysis, who are one of the key companies that is doing this sort of blockchain um, analysis. And they've shown that whilst the absolute proportion of 
illicit activity is increasing over time, the relative proportion is actually decreasing. And so in 2021, it was 0.15%. Um, now for comparison, I believe that um, uh, money laundering is something like two to 5% of global GDP every year. And that's not in crypto, that's just in general. Um, and so whilst that's not condoning any criminal activity, it's kind of showing that actually, if you look at the numbers, it's probably on par-ish with what's happening in the wider community. Crime exists in the traditional world. It's not an exclusive Web3 thing. Which leads us on nicely to uh, legal regulation and support systems. So, um, because blockchains are pseudo-anonymous, i.e. if you transact, you are an address with a random sort of set of string of characters as your, your address, then people don't necessarily know who you are. Um, and so that allows people to potentially do things like skip regulatory oversight, particularly because blockchains typically are a global thing, so they kind of sit outside of the jurisdiction of certain countries, depending on how you set up your legal entity for the business that's running the project, of course, because if you set it up, say, in Australia or America or whatever it is, then your business has to still meet the regulatory laws of that country. Um, there are all kinds of things happening, like if you have a problem, like your stuff gets stolen or whatever, it's not necessarily clear how to get recourse. There isn't a clear way to solve disputes from a global perspective because it kind of sits outside some of the local jurisdictions. There's a clear disregard for copyright and IP law in a lot of projects, particularly in the PFP NFT space. Um, there are a bunch of people that do misleading sales and marketing tactics, um, and there is a vague or lacking government policy in general around the world. Some countries are better than others. But as I said, the landscape, regulatory landscape is maturing and, and I'll just in a sec, I'll show you that. Um, interestingly, you start looking at some of the big law firms, they're starting to create Web3 practices and actually specializing this. And this isn't just like little law firms, this is stuff like I was looking at Skadden who are a, um, they're like the number one international law firm for securities and mergers and acquisitions. They have a Web3 practice. And so they're helping their clients to navigate this stuff from a legal perspective. Um, another really interesting thing is that some sort of decentralized dispute resolution protocols, think of it like a, a court that's like decentralized and global, are actually starting to pop up. Two in particular you can look at if you're interested are Aragon and Kleros, that's with a K-L-E-R-O-S. Um, worth having a look at, very interesting kind of projects. Now, from a project perspective, if you're building something, um, I think there's things you can do, like avoid some of the dodgier parts of the ecosystem, like crypto trading, as an example. Um, just because you're building something in Web3 doesn't mean you shouldn't go and get legal and regulatory advice like you would in a normal project. Um, make sure you understand the IP and copyright implications of anything that you're putting up. Um, make it clear to your users what you are and aren't transferring to them if they purchase one of your, your tokens. Um, you know, obviously then there's the normal stuff like avoid misleading sales and marketing tactics and um, you know, consider adding like support processes and dispute resolution for your users just because maybe some of the rest of the industry doesn't do it doesn't mean that you shouldn't. Now, I mentioned that the regulatory landscape is evolving. Um, so um, this is happening like as we speak, month by month. So in the US, as an example, in March, I think it was, Joe Biden signed an executive order basically saying that he wants to actively, oh, hello, uh, he wants to actively support assessing the risks of digital assets and pursuing responses and have a broad but cautious support for innovation in the area. Now, last month in September, four reports got released by the US government, um, Department of Treasury and one of the other departments, I can't remember, and they talk about uh, the need for a central bank digital currency, so basically a a, a you know, government sanctioned ver digital version of the US dollar. Um, they talked about how this stuff can affect and, and add risk to unbanked and underbanked populations. So that's people that either don't have a bank account or they don't really have access to the sorts of um, financial services that I imagine a lot of us have access to, like getting loans and things like that. Um, they talked about how do we sort of prevent money laundering and and counter-terrorism financing and extend the existing AML and CTF. Oh, that's misspelled. Huh. Um, I copied that from their website, I think. Or maybe I did type that, I don't know. Anyway, um, 
Uh, and then the, um, how do we apply our regulatory and procedural reforms to, um, to these digital assets so the existing kind of regulations can start applying, right? And interestingly, they wanted to advocate that the US takes a leading role in standard setting regarding illicit activities at an international level. Okay, so they're going to try to lead the way, which, which you know, often happens, I think, for the, for, particularly for the US and Europe, right? So this is interesting. This all happened last month, yeah? So this is evolving as we go. Um, from a, an Australian perspective, a little bit closer to home, um, again, in the last six months, this has progressed forward a lot. The Treasurer released uh, a statement talking about how the, um, as it stands, the crypto sector is largely unregulated. We need to do some work to get the balance right so we can embrace new and innovative technologies whilst safeguarding consumers. And then in the meantime, in the last few months, um, we've got APRA, who's the sort of financial regulatory body in Australia. We've got the Department of Treasury. We've got um, Austrac, who are the government body responsible for tracking large money transfers internationally to detect criminal activity. And the Reserve Bank, um, all talking about this space. So this is happening here, it's happening in the US, it's happening in Europe. It's evolving rapidly as it gets more mainstream, which I think is a really good thing because it's needed. So. Let's then move on to some more practical considerations. So we've got diversity, inclusion, and accessibility. Now, Web3, uh, like the rest of the tech industry, is not immune to diversity issues. Um, the, uh, and in particular, I would say that the Web3 community can be quite defensive, and we already talked about the obscured language. It can be hard to kind of break into. Uh, and I would say that Web3 technology right now is not accessible, it's awful. There is a lot that needs to be improved there. Um, and interestingly, whilst a lot of proponents for Web3 would talk about how decentralization can actually bring more social equity and allow people that are unbanked or underbanked to have better access to financial services, there is a risk of actually widening the wealth and social inequality because um, you kind of need access to internet and reliable, reliable internet and power to be able to use this stuff. And so some of the communities that do have that inequality potentially don't have access to that. So that's an interesting consideration. From a um, industry focus, what I would say is, and being, you know, seeing this stuff unfold, there is a huge amount of focus on startups trying to solve this sort of, um, solve for, sorry, this sort of unbanked and social inequity situation. Um, and in particular in Africa, um, South America, and, and, and some parts of Asia where there are a much higher proportion of unbanked and underbanked people, um, a lot of these startups are coming from those areas, which I think is really interesting and good. Now, if you're building a project, what are the things you can do? If you're building a community, you should have a code of conduct, you should enforce it, um, and you should cultivate a culture of openness, support, inclusion, and respect. These aren't different to like Web3 versus not, these are general things you should be doing anyway. Um, I think it's important to educate users on the technology, financial and security literacy that they would need to be able to engage in this so that you, like if someone comes to your project and they aren't, um, you know, uh, uh, up to speed with any of that stuff that they have an ability to, you know, get it, to learn what they need to learn to be able to engage with it. Um, and look, you, should do what you should be doing anyway and incorporate best practice accessibility. Um, Web3 apps are still just web apps and or mobile apps. We've got things like WCAG standards, etc. Now, a really interesting um, example to break things up a bit that, that I thought was, um, you know, maybe a good example of how um, this technology can help, help the underbanked. When the Taliban came into Afghanistan, a number of things happened. So the Taliban themselves froze assets, particularly from women and people of different religions to them. Um, the notes in Afghanistan are paper notes and they get like ripped and that sort of stuff. And the um, notes get printed outside the country and the flow of notes coming in stopped. Sanctions meant that money was seized from the central bank. Swift services, which is the traditional kind of international payment mechanism into Afghanistan was stopped. And all of this meant that there's basically no liquidity in the country. People couldn't get money out of the bank accounts, you couldn't get loans or anything like that. And over half of the population was at risk of, um, you know, being impacted by food security issues. Now, the interesting thing is that cryptocurrency allowed people in the country to immediately be able to, like, trade with each other 
in a way that avoided the traditional ecosystem that was financial ecosystem that was obviously not working. Um, now, look, it's not a silver bullet. There's obviously a lack of access to internet and reliable power in Afghanistan. And uh, sadly, last month, the Taliban crackdown made crypto illegal and basically all the usage kind of dropped to almost nothing. Um, but it's an interesting example of like what, some of what this technology can actually do. Right, so user experience. Um, we've already talked about all the confusing terminology. The wallet experience and payment experience in general is awful and confusing. Um, uh, and I'll I think I'll show an example of that in a sec. Uh, the, um, a lot of the decentralized applications that people write have really terrible user experience. It's just like not a focus of, and, and I'm, I'm painting a broad brush. There's obviously good examples and bad examples. Um, the private key thing where you have to go and like basically secure a you know 12 to 25 five word mnemonic that's your private key that if you accidentally leak your host because someone just drains everything out of your account and you don't have any recourse like that's extreme right and most users don't know how to to deal with that like it's that's even technical people like struggle with this um and then there's also this risk of like signing the wrong transaction that gives a nefarious party access to like, pull stuff out of your account uh, now, from an industry perspective, I think it's fair to say that wallet and secret user experience is a really key industry focus. There's lots of startups spinning up to try to solve this. A lot of them are starting to explore something called decentralized identities, which I don't really have time to explain, but it's a really powerful and cool sort of technology. And, and actually, um, there's something called verified credentials that kind of tack onto it, both of which I think are very interesting in the concept of what happened with Optus in the last few weeks. Because um, it would, you know, if this technology was actually adopted, it would stop that from happening. Now, if you're building a project, what are the things that you can do? First thing, again, this is obvious stuff you should be doing anyway. Prioritize your user experience from the start. Um, our principal designer, uh, Donna Spencer, gave a talk at Yarp Perth a few weeks back around designing for Web3. And one of the things she talked about that I thought was quite good is this concept of designing for transition. And the idea here is that this new world, this new technology, the way you interact with it, it is fundamentally different uh, in a lot of ways from what we're used to. And so new users that are coming onto that are transitioning from what they're used to and the mental models they're used to to different mental models, different ways of interacting. And you need to keep that in mind if you're designing a product. And there's three key kind of elements to it. One of them is around learning so that when they first hit it, they can kind of understand what's going on and what are the new mental models, et cetera. Um, then there's the onboarding, like how do I get started, which as you'll see in a minute is awful. Um, and then there's building trust over time and making it like something that they can, you know, get used to and understand and, and all of that sort of thing. So they're the interesting kind of, I'd say the, the sort of three steps to design for from a product design perspective. Um, and then, you know, obviously I, I keep saying this again and again, because it's so important, educating users using plain language, putting it in ways they understand. And um, you know, again, things that we should be doing anyway, performing user testing, but finding the real users. And I guess, depending on who your real users are, if you're, for instance, targeting the existing um, Web3 community, a lot of them are hanging out in like Discord rather than say Twitter or whatever it might be. So go and find them where they are. Now, I promised you I would show what this terrible user experience looks like. Um, I've, I've just pulled these slides from Donna's talk I'm going to flip through them. So 28 steps to get an account to buy some crypto to actually do something, right? Um, five steps to set up a wallet, eight steps to add it to the web browser, 10 steps to move coins from the centralized exchange you bought crypto for into your wallet so that you can actually go and do the thing that you were trying to do to buy an asset or engage in a decentralized application. And then of course, we've got the 12 to 25 word recovery phrase that you now have to like safely store you know, so your life depends on it, depending on what you're going to put in that wallet. Like, quite clearly, this is very silly, yeah, and this needs to be improved. So, security and privacy is actually a nice lead on from user experience. Um, there are a lot of phishing attacks and scams out there, and as I've just talked about, there's a high consequence because if you get scammed, you lose all the stuff in your wallet, yeah? Um, and there's stuff you can do, like have cold wallets and stuff, but that just adds more complexity. Um, smart contracts, as they're called, are not so smart. It's like writing, um, 
like embedded software program is very low level. You're like dealing with like raw memory and stuff like that. It's really easy to get that stuff wrong. And interestingly, the Web3 ecosystem still hasn't really got these like really evolved sort of software engineering practices that we might be used to if you're building like enterprise apps. So things like automation and continuous delivery aren't that common. Um, there is a global shortage of security reviewers that can understand and review smart contracts and they're also very expensive and you have to wait a long time to get access to them. Um, if you put things in a public blockchain and they are not encrypted, um, they're public, yeah? So if you put someone's personally identifying information, for instance, in your, in your payload there, well, that's now on a public blockchain. So there's a privacy issue there if you don't handle that the right way. Um, and then there's these things called airdrops where people can just like drop random stuff in your in your wallet um, and that might have like illicit content in it or you know maybe they put some money in your wallet and then you now have a tax implication for that or something like that. There's a number of issues there uh, and, and with everything the consequences here are immutable. If you get something wrong it's you can't you can't reverse it. It's there. Now from an industry perspective um, there are some things like privacy preserving chains and mixes that kind of like anonymize some of your like transactions. Um, there's an interesting thing there around like criminal activity and there was a, an example recently where one of these um, privacy protocols from a it's called Tornado got like just sanctioned suddenly by the US and, and all of it just got shut down. Um, and sure there was some criminal stuff in there but there was some real people doing stuff as well. Uh, some chains protect against airdrops, so Algorand is an example of that. You have to opt into an asset before you can receive it. And um, there are increasingly um, startups kind of forming that allow you to do sort of this like decentralized encryption of, of data using your, um, and, and often they're actually using decentralized identities which I briefly talked about before. Um, so there are kind of like technologies that are coming about to help with the, okay, I still want to have verifiability and, 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 and immutability or whatever other architectural properties that are needed for my use case, but I don't want the data, the private data to be stored like, you know, in a way that's exposed. Well, there's services to deal with that now. If you're building a project, um, you know, use best practice software engineering just because everyone else is isn't, doesn't mean that you shouldn't be using continuous delivery and automated testing and all of these sorts of things. Um, consider going the next level up and doing formal verification or model-based testing, um, which are like intensive, but they give you a lot of confidence that your software is doing what you think it should be doing. Um, you know, engage these smart contract verification services, but make sure you take into account the lead time for that and the cost. Um, Yeah, like uh, consider doing things like bug bounties, educate your users on security, we've already talked about that. Um, and then just be careful with what you store on chain, um, that especially if it's not encrypted, like, and consider things like GDPR. Again, just because you're doing Web3 doesn't mean you shouldn't be following like all the stuff that's out there that's been established over years. So next one, crypto speculation and pyramid schemes. I've kind of already mentioned I'm not really into the whole crypto speculation thing. Some people are and that's fine. Um, so I think there's a disproportionate focus uh, in at least public discussion and, and maybe the early parts of the Web3 ecosystem on crypto and NFT speculation and on the whole unnatural financial gain, I'm gonna become a millionaire overnight, which is clearly not sustainable and you know, all of that sort of thing, right? Like that's a clear focus. I don't think it's healthy. Um, I avoid all of that stuff, right? Um, some people would say that a lot of the Web3 stuff is around justifying the underlying crypto so that the early people get more money. I think, I think for some chains that's probably true. I think for others they're probably, their focus is much more on this concept of utility, um, doing real world, like having real, real world impact. Um, the ironic thing I guess being that if some of this stuff happens then the rich get richer which is um, you know, against that whole concept of underbanked and, and social uh, equity and that sort of thing. 
From an industry perspective, it's worth pointing out that there are things called stable coins and also asset-backed currencies. Now, what this means is that the digital representation is actually backed by a physical real-world asset. So you can get a USDC as an example, and for every one USDC, there's a company that has at least one American dollar sitting in a traditional bank account is basically the idea of how it works. And so these are much more stable than you know, the, the cryptocurrencies and they enable you to have more stable transactions. Um, and then from the, this value perspective, um, there's a really great article by NASDAQ that's in my blog post, I'll link to it at the end, um, that talks about the value of any currency is based on two things. Firstly, buy-in, which is this concept of speculation, the whole pyramid scheme of the people that come in later, lose out and all that stuff, but also on utility. And like I said, I think there's an increasing focus in the industry on the utility side of it. We're building things that have real world impact and so that's what we're representing. We don't care as much about the speculation. Now, if you're building a project, some of the things you can do, you can be clear on your motives to your community. Um, you don't have to engage in the speculative activity. We aren't, for instance. And um, choose your, your blockchain carefully. Again, something I'm going to say a few times in this talk. Um, some blockchain ecosystems are much more about speculation. Bitcoin's a good example of that. So, uh, value and technology complexity. Some people uh, will say that uh, Web3 has a complete lack of real world value. And I think, as I've just kind of talked about, some parts of it, absolutely, other parts, less so. Um, they'll also say Bitcoin's been around for 13 years, it's had 13 years to prove itself, it's not early. Um, and I think that's true for Bitcoin, but I'd say that as the ecosystems evolved, some of the later ones, they've, the ones that are really kind of being used now for real world use cases, they've only really been around for like two or three years. Um, obviously, we've talked about the profile picture images not being that valuable. Um, the other key thing that people talk about is the fact that blockchain solutions are more complex than just building something in a database. Um, and I think um, often that is true. Um, in some circumstances, especially where the architectural properties that you need for your solution align really well, like the ones I talked about at the start, then um, that's not necessarily the case. The blockchain can actually help. Um, but for sure, people, you know, it's a tech industry, right? We build tech for the sake of tech. Um, and absolutely, there will be solutions that people will build that will be like way more complex than they need to be and you could have just built it as a Web2 solution, for sure. Um, and the interesting thing, of course, being you still need Web2 tech, quote unquote. Um, you, if you, if you have a web application, you still need DNS and, and cloud hosting and, and all of that stuff that you know, we're, we're used to. And this is where I think the labeling of Web3 is probably less helpful because it implies that it's like an evolution and it's, it's all or nothing, when in reality it's not. It's just adding to another option, another tool in the toolkit, I guess, to what we already had. Um, all of the stuff that we do today still applies. It's not gonna go away. That's my opinion, at least. Uh, so, uh, some interesting points here from an industry perspective. The third generation blockchains are like at the point now where they've been around, as I say, for two to three years. Um, they've proven themselves and they're really maturing and people are starting to build real world things on them, which is really cool. Um, and, and obviously, I've said this a few times, but NF NFTs are not profile pics. That's a tiny sliver of what they can be. Now, if you're building a project, um, this is one of my mantras, use the right tool for the job, right? Maybe part of your solution could be blockchain based. Um, but that doesn't mean you have to use it for all of it. Or maybe the whole thing could be decentralized and that makes sense. Or maybe it doesn't make sense at all and you shouldn't use it. That's fine. You should look at that for each project or even each feature, right? Um, the outcome is more important than the technology. We shouldn't build tech for the sake of tech. Um, I think it's important to educate yourself firstly, on what value means for your project, and then also educate your users. What, what are the, what's the thing that's valuable? Don't focus on all the crypto weird stuff, like this is what we're modeling and this is valuable. Um, and you know, the usual stuff, right? Avoid unnecessary complexity, keep your system simple, uh, make deliberate architecture decisions, including which blockchain you choose, the most important one, I guess. Uh, so this is, this is a quote from me. <laughs> um, I think if someone says like everything that can be done in Web3 can be done in Web2, that's a bit like saying everything that can be done with microservices can be done with a monolith. 
um, that statement is not nuanced enough. Some things are better suited to one or the other depending on what you're actually doing, i.e. use the right tool for the job, yeah? Uh, now, I mentioned uh, NFTs, not just PFPs. This is just a very brief uh, view of what that might look like. The way I see it, NFTs are part of tokenization, which I described at the start. Tokenization can help transform all of these industries because they all have aspects of them at least where the properties of tokenization can represent things that they're doing and make processes more efficient. And there are examples out there of people representing all of these things with NFTs, right? Like royalties, game items, um, like access, like tickets, um, you know, loyalty points, um, intellectual property licensing. There's all kinds of things that you can that you can represent. At the end of the day, and an NFT is just a pointer an immutable pointer in a blockchain to some metadata, right? Um, you can represent whatever you want. So I wanted to talk through a couple of examples. Just checking my time here. Uh, I wanted to talk through a couple of examples that we'd actually um, done ourselves uh, so that, um, or been involved with in some way, so that I could, A, break up the monotony of what we're going through, because as I said, it's heavy content, and I know it is, and I'm sorry. Um, but also just to, you know, talk about some, like, real, real world value stuff. So the first one is this. This is the first thing that we did. This is the reason why we even went into this whole space, is because we had this idea. The idea was this. You've got a museum with a physical, historical artifact sitting in it. And we thought about that and we said, okay, there's two intrinsic properties that make that historic artifact a historic artifact. One of them is causality, which is the idea that you can draw a causal link from that object in the current point in time back through history to the point in time that it was either created or touched that made it historic. You can prove that it was there at that point in time through carbon dating, um, and that's a, that's a causal link. And then the second property is originality, which is the concept that that is the historic artifact and not the copy that you can buy for $20 in the gift store. Now, what we realized was that for the first time ever, a public blockchain gives you the ability to model those two intrinsic properties in a digital form. So causality becomes the mint time of an artifact uh, token in a blockchain. And if you can mint that artifact close to or when the historic event happens, then um, that's an immutable fact, and that becomes the equivalent of carbon dating, because the thing was minted when it happened. Um, and that's the causal link, the mint time. And then um, originality directly translates to non-fungibility. So we mint them as a non-fungible token. And so we started off with earthquakes and solar flares. So we have a system that is automatically listening for when an earthquake happens of a certain magnitude, um, and also when uh, a solar flare happens. And um, we mint these tokens, and we call them verifiably authentic digital historical artifacts. We actually mint the metadata with them, including things like the magnitude or the peak flux capacity of the solar flare. We actually have a video of the solar flares um, uh, as well from the satellites that, that, were, that were taken. And the whole point of doing this is to create this sort of like immutable historic record of human, cosmic, and terrestrial history. Because um, so much of our history is becoming digital these days and it's getting lost, basically. Um, our long-term vision for this is to change the way that science is funded globally, and I don't really have time to explain why, but this is one of the projects that we did. That you know We couldn't do this without a public blockchain. We needed a public blockchain. We needed the architectural properties of a public blockchain to be able to pull it off. Another one that we're starting, um, we're, we're working on at the moment, with uh, a client called uh, Venture Crowd, who are a VC in Australia. They're trying to democratise private funding rounds such that retail investors, people like us, can get access to the information and um, data and, and access really to be informed enough to be able to make investment decisions and um, do that in the context of a community of interest. Um, so one of the first ones, for instance, is the future of sex, as an example. And so they'll have, like, community leaders in that community. They'll have startups that come that are relevant to that community. They'll have people that come that are interested in that. And they'll all work together for the success of these companies and also for the ability to participate in the private funding rounds. Now, largely what we're building is a fund management system using Web2 Tech on AWS. But um, we're also putting part of it on the blockchain. We're using the Algorand blockchain 
and we're representing the cap table that results from the funding rounds on the blockchain. So rather than it sitting in like an Excel sheet behind a corporate firewall, it's actually publicly inspectable and allows in the future the ability to um, make those um, shares a bit more liquid so that they can be traded so you don't have to wait multiple years for the next funding round to be able to exit out. So that's another interesting example. The third one I'm going to talk about is uh, this one here, which is something called Met Amazonia. So I've been talking to the founder of this company, he's an incredible person, like what he's pulled together. There's like 26 different parties that he's corralled together to pull this thing off. Um, so I've just been giving him some advice. We're not like participating on this uh, at this stage at least. But um, what he's done is he's gone and purchased 20,000 hectares of land in the Amazon rainforest. He's gone and gotten it all carbon accredited with the number one carbon credit, creditor, creditor uh, globally uh, for 35 years with a, with a land management plan. He's engaged the local community around there to give them jobs so that they can go and help manage that land, um, farm the non-timber products, so things like uh, acai berries and and Brazilian nuts and stuff like that, and also perform surveys uh, of the like flora and fauna and that sort of thing. And then, in addition, and and I and I do apologise, there is a lot of buzzwords in this, um, but it, this is real. I've seen this. Like they've engaged a company in Finland who builds games to build a photorealistic version of this these plots of land based on lidar scans of the um, the rainforest under the canopy. Um, so that you can go in there and see what it's actually like there. And they've get, they're getting IoT devices to do things like record audio so you can actually hear what the audio, like the sounds of the rainforest, like in near real time. Um, and why are they doing this? Because that's like a whole lot of wild like tech stuff. The reason why they're doing it is because they're trying to create a platform that helps them fight climate change, poverty and deforestation and they're using blockchain to represent certain aspects of the um, assets, I guess, that are being generated. So things like the virtual representation of the land plots, the carbon credits, the non-timber products, and also representations of certain R&D projects that they're performing in the area in conjunction with certain universities around things like carbon sequestration, et cetera. And by putting this in a blockchain platform, they can get globally, get people to kind of put money in to make this thing possible. So, Fascinating example, right? There's a lot going on there. Um, feel free to check it out. Um, but I just wanted to give you a few examples, A, to lighten the talk up because it's getting pretty heavy there and, um, uh, you know, and because and I think it's important to talk about like real world like use cases. So um, we've got like the last few of these. Decentralization and trust. Whew. Okay, so uh, People that like criticize Web3 will often say, well, full decentralization doesn't make sense, which I agree with. You're never gonna get rid of the government. You kind of need them there for the support system and on all of that sort of stuff, right? Um, and then um, they'll say, you know, it's not fully decentralized anyway, because there's things like centralized exchanges. Um, the node um, runners are typically a number of bigger companies running them, and you still need to use things like DNS for your applications, right? Um, again, I don't really care about the whole, just everything should be decentralized. Like, I don't think that's a very pragmatic way of looking at it, right? Um, so, um, but yeah, anyway, still, it's the criticism that people have. Um, it's been clear that laws can override the idea of code is law and the smart contract is what it is because there have been court cases that have happened where, um, you know, people have been taken to court based on something that they did and then it got like, you know, they had to kind of revert it basically. Um, I actually think that's a good thing, though, because uh, otherwise we don't have any mechanism to be able to support people, right? And we talked about the regulatory stuff before. Um, what are other interesting ones to talk about? Uh, I guess the other one's kind of just, yeah, th this whole kind of concept of, like, um, if it goes too far, that whole decentralise everything, it becomes this sort of anti-democracy casino mindset, which isn't necessarily a good thing. Um, and also, I said this before, we're in the tech industry, we often build tech for the sake of tech, and I think a lot of Web3 is absolutely doing that. Um, and at the end of the day, we're going to solve real world problems, not just through technology, but also through the socioeconomics that has to go hand in hand, yeah? Um, so that's fine, that just means that when we're building projects, we can keep that in mind, yeah? 
So um, I would say decentralization isn't an end user outcome. It's a property that you might want to exercise on all or part of your solution, yeah? The thing that's important is the end user outcome. Um, I think it's important that we establish clear regulation and support mechanisms, and as I showed you before, that's really rapidly evolving now. And um, I'd say that some of the criticisms that exist about proof of stake networks and that they're not as decentralized, so they're less secure, like they've been proving themselves. Um, is my, that's my personal opinion, that one. Um, and now if you're building a project, uh, I think you should make, and I kind of said this before, a per feature determination on, um, you know, when, when do you need this stuff? When should it be decentralized or trustless? Um, you know, what, uh, what centralized mechanisms make sense to put in? Put them in where they, where they make sense. Especially, frankly, at the moment, if they help with things like user experience. If you can use a service like magic.link that lets you um, uh, use your single sign-on, like single click social identity to um, get a, um, you know, a, a wallet that you can interact with without going through the pain of all those steps, well, sure, maybe you're relying on a centralized identity, but the user experience and, frankly, security is so much better that practically that's what you should be doing. Um, yeah, cool. So, uh, speed and cost. Very close now. <laughs> Some blockchains, very slow, inefficient, expensive. That's one of the big complaints. Um, there's a low storage capacity, and that storage is very expensive. Um, the fact that the nodes have to store the entire history of that blockchain, which is multiple gigabytes and it grows constantly, is an interesting one. Um, there are some things called light clients that are starting to come out to uh, deal with that from a tech perspective. So I feel like that's just a tech problem. But um, There's this concept of transaction finality that's really interesting, which is that if you commit a transaction for some chains, you then have to wait multiple rounds for that transaction to actually be considered final because a fork might develop in the blockchain that then becomes the main part of the chain and your transaction just ceases to exist, which is a crazy concept. Not all blockchains have that though, but worth keeping in mind if you are using one that does, right? Um, and some chains uh, have uh, prioritized, let's say, speed over um, uh, stability and have terrible, terrible outages like Solana as an example. Um, and not all t t transactions per second stats are equal. Um, not trying to pick on Solana, but that, that, as an example, they say, oh, we've got 65,000 transactions per second, um, but a large majority of those are actually consensus transactions where the nodes are communicating with each other to decide on what the, what the result should be. So some of those are kind of not real transactions. And, Interestingly, in some blockchains, with one transaction, you can do something that would take, say, 100 in another blockchain based on the architectural properties of that blockchain. So again, choose your blockchain carefully based on what you're actually trying to do. Um, I'd say that, in general, the third generation blockchains, like Algorand, Hedera, whatever, um, are generally fast and low cost. And I've said this like five times, but um, be careful with your blockchain consideration, right? And, and match it to what you're trying to do because different chains will be suitable for different tasks based on their architectural properties. Um, this gives you a very, uh, you know, we're not gonna like look through all this in detail, but um, to give you an example, we can look at things like transaction per second. So Visa, on average, 1,700. Um, max, about 24,000, yeah? So you can kind of start looking at these and comparing them to Visa to get a feel for, could one of these replace Visa one day, as an example? But then you've got things like the block time, like if I commit a transaction, how often are those transactions committed? Um, the f transaction finality, some of them are instant, some of them are like, like look at Bitcoin. If you, if you um, put a transaction in, it can take 40 minutes to know whether or not that transaction went through. If you go to a retailer and you want to buy something with Bitcoin, which you can do in Ecuador and a couple other countries, 40 minutes. I, I, honestly, I don't actually know how that works. Um, transaction fees, another really interesting one. And certainly, you, you obviously, you see here like the whole Bitcoin, Ethereum. Um, it is variable based on the like load on the blockchain. But like some of the others, like as an example, like Hedera is 0.01 cents. Um, Algorand, 0.03 cents. Tiny. Um, and then it's worth looking at like their uptime, so, um, and, and, and how long they've been running, because it gives you a feel for how mature they are, yeah? So, again, useful to like consider this stuff. 
Okay, the last one, volatility. <laughs> so the underlying crypto tokens fluctuate. There is, you know, instances of market manipulation. Um, whilst the regulatory landscape changing is a good thing, that obviously creates some uncertainty about where it's going to land. Um, liquidity markets keep getting hacked. Some people say that some of the stable coins aren't actually stable because the companies behind them are a bit dodgy. So do your research, if, depending on what you're going to use. Um, and then, as I said, some of the blockchains actually aren't that stable, but a, a lot of them are actually very good. Um, I think this regulatory landscape is getting a lot clearer. And I think it's fair to say that there's a multi-year like proof, if you will, on the stability of certain blockchains. Um, so look, if you're building a project, consider the potential regulatory changes, um, hedge against them, and carefully choose your blockchain. <laughs> so in summary, if you are thinking about maybe using a blockchain or frankly just having a conversation with your colleagues, Maybe this is a good mental model to use so that you can be informed on all of the different considerations that you could make and think about. At the end of the day, my like top kind of key things, use the right tool for the job on a per feature basis, uh, focus on value and end user outcomes, not technology, and please carefully choose your blockchain. Uh, and we're done. And I think I probably have like zero seconds for questions, but maybe come and, uh, come and chat to me afterwards if you, if you have any. So thank you very much.